Amen. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. We are in John chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I know that if you uh, perhaps uh, follow our profiles there on social media, you saw the notes that I put out for you, and in those notes took you all the way through verse 13. And we were going to look at both the necessity and the mechanism of the new birth, but the more I have poured over this passage, the more I have uh, studied it and begun to be prepared to preach this morning, the more I've come to the understanding uh, a couple things. First, uh, I do not want to rush through this passage. I want us to take as much time as we need to understand this passage uh, rightly and not rush. Now, I'm telling you this morning, I'm not planning on going all the way through verse 13. Uh, I plan to go all the way through verse seven, but I'm not gonna make a promise to you that in the time that is allotted, I'm actually going to make it through verse one through seven. So uh, if we need to pause, we will pause and then regather next Sunday and pick up where we left off. But this morning, we look at John chapter three, verse one through seven, the necessity of the new birth. The necessity of the new birth. Jesus is going to say multiple times here, you must be born again. If you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. If you're not born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And then he tells Nicodemus, do not marvel, don't be surprised, don't be shocked, don't be amazed that I tell you, you, you must be born again. Would that all of us in this room would understand the necessity of the new birth in order to see, perceive, understand, know anything about the kingdom of God, in order to enter, to have access to the kingdom of God, you have to have a miracle performed in you. And friends, we don't have the power to initiate or accomplish miracles. You must be born again. Did you have any part in your being born the first time? Question answered. The new birth is miraculous. It is uninitiated by man. It originates in the sovereign choosing and purposes of God and it is actuated only by his power. And Jesus makes it very clear. He says multiple times, truly, truly I say to you, you must be born again. So this morning, I want to summarize this morning's message in this sentence, as I normally do for you, if you'll write this down with me. To enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Brother Eric, do you notice some things missing from that sentence? To enter the kingdom of God, does it say anything about church membership? Brother Mark, does it say anything about church attendance? What, what's, the, what's the entry stakes to get into the kingdom of God? Being born again, it's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. There are, there are many who are deceived and believe that they understand the kingdom of God and will enter the kingdom of God because they go to a building they call a church. Because they sing songs about God. Because they own a Bible, read or not. They think, well, I must be going to heaven. And people have this assumption everybody goes to heaven. But Jesus tells us that there are actually very few who find their way into the kingdom of God. 
To enter the kingdom of God, there must be a miracle. There must be a miracle take place within you. You must be born again. Now, we're not gonna be able to talk this morning so much about the mechanism, the process, that is, of the new birth, how God accomplishes it, but this morning we will, we will dive into the necessity of it. Why is it necessary? Why is it a must to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to enter the kingdom of God? Now you recall, in just the previous paragraph, that John, in his gospel, he tells us that those who are in Jerusalem, those who are in Israel, they are, they're, they're seeking to make Jesus king. They're, they're impressed with Jesus, with all the signs, the miracles, the wonders. They're impressed with his teaching. But what does it say about Jesus? It says that Jesus would not entrust himself to anyone. Why? Because he knew what was inside of man and needed no one to tell him. Jesus knows, just as he knew then, exactly what is inside of us. And what was the verdict of that knowledge? The conclusion that Jesus came to, based on that omniscient understanding of our hearts, is that there is utterly nothing trustworthy or dependable in the heart of mankind. Which necessitates the new birth. If there is nothing good within the unregenerate man, if there is nothing trustworthy in unregenerate man, then, then unregenerate man must be made new. He must be made something totally and entirely different than what he is. Otherwise, he can't see the kingdom of God, can't enter the kingdom of God. Jesus won't even entrust himself to those people. Why would he ever allow them into his kingdom? So he must be born again. Now Jesus is going to have an extended conversation with a man named Nicodemus as recorded here in John chapter three. When we look at these first seven verses, we're going to understand, we're gonna see two reasons that Jesus gives us for why we must be born again. Now the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus extends far beyond the parameter of the text that we're gonna look at this morning, but we're gonna see the necessity what is the need? Why does Jesus say you must be born again? There are two reasons that he gives. So let's begin walking through the passage here. It says in verse one, now there was a man of the Pharisees. Again, the Pharisees, we've looked at these before. This was the largest religious political group there in Israel in those days. These are the people, the men who believed themselves to be experts in the law of Moses, though they had long before truly abandoned the law of Moses and they had bound themselves to the interpretations of rabbis rather than the word of God. But they prided themselves nonetheless in understanding the word of God. Nicodemus here, he is even a ruler. He is the teacher of Israel. And he comes to Jesus, says in verse one, a ruler of the Jews. This man is not only a teacher of the Jews, this man is not only a Pharisee, he is a ruler of the Jews, which means he is one of the Sanhedrin. He is one of the top 70 men in all of Israel. Jesus is going to say he is the number one teacher. He is the, one of the top 70 men, religious and political, in all of Israel, and he comes to Jesus. It says in verse two, this man came to Jesus by night. Why would Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Now, later on in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 19, we read about a man named Joseph of Arimathea, an extremely wealthy man. He is the man who lent his tomb to Jesus. That's the only kind of Lent that should have anything to do with Easter, by the way. But he lent his tomb to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is gonna give it back to him three days later. But Joseph of Arimathea, it says, Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus, albeit secretively. 
And he was secretly a disciple of Jesus, says very clearly, for fear of the Jews. Now you have Nicodemus who is coming to Jesus and he comes to him by night. Why? I would assume some of the same reasons. For fear of the Jews. People are already divided about Jesus. The, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish rulers, they see Jesus as a threat. They see him as a problem. Oh, these hosts and multitudes of Israel are following after Jesus, and so he is threatening their leadership. He is threatening their authority. He is threatening their ability to rule the people of Israel. And so Nicodemus does not want to be seen with Jesus. That's about the most basic generic statement you could say. That's why he comes at night, so there's no light he does not want to be seen with Jesus, but he comes to Jesus with questions, and I believe very sincere questions. He seems to, he seems to be desirous of having a legitimate conversation with Jesus. I asked the kids last night, as I normally do on Saturday nights, I'll walk through the sermon text with them, and I, if I can't preach it to them in about 10 minutes, I surely can't explain it to you in 55 or 60. So we, we talk about it, and I asked the kids, I said, why would Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Well, and, and the boys, they said, well, maybe he, he's, he's scared of what people will think about him. And I said, you're right, I think you're right. And then Addie Jo gave a very insightful commentary. She said, so they wouldn't get interrupted. Because all day long, Jesus has people around him. And, and now they can just talk through the night. I thought, wow, I didn't read that in any commentaries. I didn't read that anywhere, but that, that's sharp. That's sharp. And it, it truly is. The, Nicodemus and Jesus have a very extended conversation here in John 3, but he comes to him by night. And he says to him, verse 2, Rabbi, that is teacher, esteemed one, Rabbi, we know Underline that, if you, if you do mark in your Bible, if you don't mark in your Bible, you shouldn't have convictions about that, it's okay. But you can underline that in your Bible, because we'll come back to it next week, Lord willing. Rabbi, we know, we are sure of this. There are some things that we understand, good teacher. We know this, that you are a teacher come from God. What an acknowledgement, Brother Carlton. We, we know that you are a teacher come from God. That sounds like Nicodemus is a believer. We know where you come from, we believe. Who is the we? He, he's talking about himself and the other Pharisees. Oh, we, we know that you have come from God. My immediate question is, then why don't you believe him? Why don't you trust him? It's easy to say we know things about Jesus. It's another thing entirely to truly believe. Come in the daytime if you know. Maybe you don't really know or you're not too sure. We know that you have come from God. Why? Because no one, for no one can do these things, these signs that you do unless God is with them. No one can do these miracles well, what miracles, what signs had Jesus done up to this point? We saw really one miracle. This is, a, this is an event of such note that it causes people to stop and think that something special is being revealed because it's not an everyday, ordinary event. It says these signs that you're doing. Now, Jesus had performed one sign, but he performed that in front of slaves and his disciples, didn't he? When he turned water into wine. That's what John records. John does not spend his time recording many of the miracles that Jesus performed. That's not his purpose. I want to read it for you and keep it before your, your mind here. The purpose of John in his gospel. And this is the purpose of our understanding of this passage today. John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's purpose is not to record all of the miracles of Jesus. John's purpose is to lead you to believe in Jesus. And what you see by these miracles recorded in the Gospels is they never produce saving faith. 
John doesn't need to record all the miracles for you to believe who Jesus is. That belief is a gift from God. It's not the product of miracles. The belief is the miracle. Now, Matthew records many of the miracles, many of the signs that Jesus performed. I'm gonna run through this little litany of miracles and signs that Jesus had performed all the way before he even called Matthew to be his disciple. Matthew chapter four, Jesus heals various diseases, cures people of pains, heals those who are oppressed by demons, heals people with seizures, heals paralytics. In Matthew chapter eight, he cures an incurable skin disease called leprosy. He heals the centurion's paralyzed servant. He heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. He drives out demons. He heals all the sicknesses. He drives out the demons from the Gadarene demoniac. And in Matthew chapter nine is where the paralyzed man is lowered down through the roof of that house and Jesus performs two miracles. He forgives the man's sins and then he says, rise up and walk. And both things took place that day. John does not record any of these miracles. Obviously, Nicodemus and the other Pharisees are very well aware of what's been going on, and they're saying nobody, nobody could do these miracles unless they have been sent by God. Why does he say that nobody could do these miracles unless they've been sent by God? Listen to the testimony of one of the men who Jesus healed, the man who was born blind, John chapter nine. This man says this to the Jews. He says, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Acts chapter two, verse two, the preaching of the apostle Peter. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. How? With mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Peter's gonna continue to say, this Jesus you crucified and God raised him up from the dead. What do these signs prove? What does the ability to do supernatural miracles prove about Jesus? It proves that he has come from God. Then why won't Nicodemus and the other Pharisees believe? Ask that question and keep it on your mind. They know the miracles. They know the signs. They make the acknowledgement, we know you've come from God. And while they acknowledge this about Jesus, they refuse to believe in him. Why? Why can't they just, why can't they just make that 18 inch leap from their head to their heart? Why can't they do it? They're not born again. They're not born again. They can observe, but they can't really see. They can see, but they can't really believe. Because you know what faith is? Faith is seeing with the heart. It is a conviction of the soul. Nicodemus is incapable of that at this point. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus, in verse three, answered him, truly, truly, amen, amen. Not only does he give strong affirmation of what he is about to say with the first amen, but he doubles it. He intensifies and solemnifies what he is saying to the highest degree possible in the Greek vernacular. This is not a secondary issue. This is a primary of utmost importance kind of issue. Truly, truly, I say to you, it's as if Jesus is yelling this. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. 
John, in his gospel, is the only one of the four gospel writers that, that records Jesus as saying, Amen, Amen, truly, truly. And in John's gospel, John records Jesus saying that 25 times. These are indispensable, solemn truths. Don't pass these up. He says it multiple times in this passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, that word for born is the word genao, genao. In the Greek, that is where we get the word genesis, genao, to begot, to be born, to be beget. Did you know that almost every time genao is used in the New Testament, it is speaking not of a woman giving birth. Almost every time that genao is used in the New Testament is speaking of a father begetting a child. That this work is coming from the father. Unless one is born again, unless the father does a new work, Nicodemus, he's got one way to understand this. One way to understand this. Got a human way of understanding this. We'll see that in a moment. Jesus says, unless one is born again, you got to be born twice to enter the kingdom of God. You got to be born twice to see the kingdom of God. Well, my first question is this, not what does it mean to be born again? My first question is, what's the kingdom of God and what's so special about that? Why do I even care about being born again? What, what does that mean to me? You only live once. Unless the kingdom of God is of such import, unless the kingdom of God is so remarkable that you should do anything to enter it, anything to possess it, anything to have access, entrance, to be a citizen, to be a resident. So what is the kingdom of God? I've got six descriptors here. Surely there are more, but I've got six descriptors here for what the kingdom of God is. First, before we get to that, this is kind of just a, a low-lying definition of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule, the perfect rule of God, which is right now in heaven. What do the angels do? The angels carry out God's will. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The perfect rule of God in heaven. The kingdom of God is in heaven, number one. But the kingdom of God is also, has begun to be unveiled at the advent of Christ. When Jesus came to the earth, when he was born of a woman, born of a virgin, God began to unveil his kingdom here on the earth. Finally, the kingdom of God will be fully unveiled at the end of the age. God will fully unveil his kingdom at the end of the age. So here's six things, six things that you need to understand about the kingdom of God. First off, the kingdom of God is imminent. Imminent, I-M-M-I. I used I-M-M-A, nint, on Wednesday. Imminent, what does it mean that the kingdom of God is imminent? It means this, it's upon you. It's right there in front of your face. The kingdom of God is pressing in on this age. Mark chapter one, verse 14 through 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That means hurry up. The kingdom of God is pressing on you. The kingdom of God is pushing you down the aisle. The kingdom of God is calling you to bend your knee and repent, have a change of mind, a change of life, and get ready because the king is coming. That's what it means for the kingdom of God to be imminent. Not only is the kingdom of God imminent, the kingdom of God is expanding. The kingdom of God is expanding. There are multiple parables whereby Jesus explains the expansive nature of the kingdom. Here's one of those, Luke chapter 13, verse 18 through 19. What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? 
It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. This is the way that the kingdom of God comes. It comes very, very small. It's planted, and then it grows into this massive, expansive tree that all manner of birds find their home in. Not only Jews, but of the Gentiles as well. Massively expansive, imminent and expansive. Thirdly, the kingdom of God is present. The kingdom of God is coming, it's imminent, it's upon you. But the kingdom of God is also present. It's right here in your midst. And this is how you know it. Matthew chapter 22, verse 28. This is what Jesus says about his work of casting out demons. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Why is Jesus casting out demons? Because he has the authority here. They don't. They don't cast Jesus out. He casts them out. And multiple times, whenever Jesus is casting the demons out, you know what they do? They plead with him. The time of judgment has not yet come. What have you to do with us, son of God? They're fearful. The kingdom of God is present. Fourthly, the kingdom of God is supernatural. Supernatural, and not only is it difficult to enter, it is, in fact, impossible to enter without the work of God. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What is a rich person? A person that feels sufficient in themselves. A person that has all they need. It doesn't need to be somebody who owns a lot. It needs to be somebody who's owned by what they've got. And Jesus says it, it's impossible. Easier for a camel to go through a small, tiny hole than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is supernatural. It's difficult, even impossible to enter. Not only that, mark this, the kingdom of God has been exclusively revealed. Exclusively revealed. Jesus did not come into the earth and tell everyone about the kingdom of God. That's our job. Jesus came to the Jews, and salvation is from the Jews. Listen to this, exclusively revealed, Luke 8, verse 10. Jesus said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. A lot of people say, and they do this in preaching class, Cody, and I don't know why. They say Jesus was a storyteller. Jesus used illustrations to show people the truth. When the Bible actually says Jesus used illustrations to conceal the truth. That's why I can't stand preaching that has a bunch of stories. Stories tend to cloud and conceal the truth. Jesus says, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. That's why after Jesus speaks in these parables, he pulls the disciples off and they go, what on earth did you mean? And he says, the parable means this, because they had no clue, they have no idea. Not only is it exclusively revealed, let me just tell you, friends, this is why you don't want to miss out. This is why you don't want to miss out on the kingdom of God. I want you to consider the death that you've seen in your life, the suffering that you see in this world, the torment that people go through, the tearing that your soul even goes through as you see this, the pains that you go through every day, the struggle that is life, let me tell you, you wanna be in the kingdom of God. Number six, the kingdom of God is eternal. Eternal. And this is why this is good news. Revelation 21, one through five. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You must be born again. Friend, don't you want to be born again? You must be born again to see, to enter the kingdom of God. And I tell you what, I want to be in the kingdom of God. I, I, don't, want, I don't want for this world to be my highest hope of existence. What a miserable life it would be. I want to look forward to the kingdom of God. I want to have access I want to have that eternal citizenship and residency there. But Jesus says this in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or oh, he cannot see, he cannot perceive. He cannot take in with the eyes. He cannot behold. Now that's not talking about entrance into the kingdom of God. Verse five is where Jesus talks about entrance into the kingdom of God. Verse three is where Jesus talks about perceiving the kingdom of God. And he tells Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And what has Nicodemus said to Jesus? We know that you have come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. And Jesus tells him, you can't see squat. You think you can see, and you see miracles, and you see signs, but you are blind and unable to see, perceive, to take in with the eyes, much less the heart. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Man, in his unregenerate state, is blind to the things of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Blind. Couldn't even see the things of God. Couldn't perceive the blessings of God. Couldn't sense the hand of God. Couldn't experience the spirit of God. Couldn't understand the words of God. I could not see the kingdom of God apart from this miracle of the new birth. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Reason number one why the new birth is necessary. Without the new birth, you are unable to see the kingdom of God. Without the new birth, you are unable to see the kingdom of God. Why am I unable to see the kingdom of God? Why, why am I unable to enter the kingdom of God? This is the next thing that Jesus is going to instruct Nicodemus about. It's not only the perception. He says, Nicodemus, you think you see and you think you understand but you really know nothing. Jesus is gonna say in verse 11, we speak of what we know, we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. You think you see things, Nicodemus, but you're blind. Why are you blind? You haven't been born again. Now, what is, happens in verse four? Nicodemus says to Jesus, he said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? That word for old is where we get our English word geriatric. I would assume that Nicodemus is, he's at least 30, you know that. So Brother Gene, 30 is old. 
That's exegetical. <laughs> anyway, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How logical of you, Nicodemus. Is he right? Well, humanly speaking, he is absolutely right. That's the issue, humanly speaking. Nicodemus, Nicodemus has no concept of God doing a miraculous work. He has no concept of there being any other way of being born than the first time in the human way. He thinks of everything in human terms. Oh, it's impossible. How, how, how could this be? That's what his question intimates. It implies. It's impossible for a person to be born again. And the answer to his question is, well, you're, you're right. You're right, it's impossible to be born again the way you're talking. No, you cannot enter your mother's womb a second time and be born. How can this be? Verse five. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, this is the second time now. Amen, amen, intensified solemnity. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless or without Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now Jesus expands a bit, doesn't he? This is what born again means, being born of water and being born of the Spirit. Born of water and born of the Spirit. Before we get to those definitions, what did he say? That if you are not born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You, you can't perceive and understand the things of God, nor can you actually have access as a citizen and resident in the kingdom of God. Well, why can't a person who has been born once, why can't a human in their natural state enter the kingdom of God? Well, the first reason a human in his natural state or her natural state cannot enter the kingdom of God is by law. By law. Matthew 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they are the keepers of the law. These are the people paying tithes out of the salt shaker. Literally. Given 10% of the pepper. These people are trying their hardest to keep the law. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. What's the logical response? My righteousness could never exceed that. These people try as hard as possible to keep the law, and even they can't. Exactly. By law, you can't enter the kingdom of God because you can't keep the law. Matthew 7, 13. <laughs> enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. And he will also say, enter by the narrow. That way is difficult. There are very few who find it. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, who does the will of the Father in heaven? The Son, not us. By law, we could not enter the kingdom of God without another work from God. Matthew 18, verse three, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You ever seen an adult humble themselves like a child? I've seen it before. And every time I've ever seen it, every time I've ever experienced it, I know for a fact it wasn't me that produced it and it wasn't that person that produced it. God did a miracle. And unless that miracle takes place, can't enter the kingdom of God. Mark chapter nine, verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye 
than with two eyes to be thrown in hell. You ought to do whatever it takes to get to the kingdom of heaven, but nobody's doing that. You can't enter the kingdom of God by law. Further, you can't enter the kingdom of God by composition. By composition. What I mean by that is this. You and I are made of the wrong stuff. You and I are made of the earth. In our unregenerate state, we, we are the descendants of breathing dirt. Our forefather is Adam. We are made from dirt, descendant from dirt. We're made of the wrong stuff. By composition, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is the very thing that the Apostle Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 15. It starts in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all, not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. Why do we need to be changed? So we're made of the wrong stuff. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. We're unable to enter the kingdom of God without the miraculous work of God himself. God has to do something to make us able to enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This is what he says. He says you must be, back in verse five, born of water and the spirit. You must be born of water and the spirit. What does it mean to be born of water? What does it more mean to be born of water? Now, I'll just tell you without further explanation from the Bible, I don't know that I would know this. I don't know that I would actually understand what it means to be born of water. But thank the Lord, he didn't just give us a verse, he gave us a book. He gave us a book for our understanding. John chapter three, verse eight is especially illuminating for us when you think about water and its functions. John chapter three, verse eight. You think about water and its functions. We use water for drinking, we use water for cooking, but one of the primary uses that we have for water is washing. Washing. John chapter three, verse eight says, or 13, pardon me, 13 verse eight. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Well, where's Jesus' share? Where's his portion? It's the kingdom of God. And unless Jesus washes you, you have no inheritance with him. You have no portion, you have no share with him. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Who is it that sprinkles the conscience clean? That's not us. That's a washing that only the judge can do. That's a washing that only God can do. Sprinkle clean the conscience. Wash the body white as snow with pure water. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. We celebrated this text last week. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. There is a washing that comes from God that we can only conceive of in the way we have to understand, which is the washing of water. Well, what does God do for us? 
He doesn't wash the outside. He washes the inside. There is a cleansing from the inside. And, 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 and when there is a cleansing of the inside, what, what is something common we would say? We would say, I got a brand new, fresh start. Feels like you're born again. A brand new lease on life. A brand new beginning. In the Bible, this is what baptism signifies. It signifies death to the old self. Resurrection to Christ. A washing away of the old person. And a resurrection of a new cleansed person. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You got to be washed. Whoever believes and is washed will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I don't believe Jesus here is talking about baptism in a baptistry. I believe he's talking about the baptism that God does in your heart. And what baptism in the baptistry does is it symbolizes that. Acts chapter 2, 38, is what Peter's talking about too. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Be washed, be cleansed, and show everybody that God has washed you clean. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So unless one is born of water, unless one receives a new beginning being cleansed by God, he can't what? Can't see and cannot enter the kingdom of God. No dirty souls in the kingdom. No dirty souls in the kingdom. Need God to wash us. So he says, you must be born of water and the spirit. And the spirit. Titus chapter three, verse three through five describes this wonderfully. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various, sin, various passions and pleasures, passing our days in envy and in malice, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of of the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. That word for renewal speaks to making something brand new. Making something brand new. Recreating it. This is why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Just a brand new, totally different substance. A new mind, a new heart. You've been washed clean, so now you can see the kingdom of God because you've got a new mind and a new heart. Now you can enter the kingdom of God because you've been purified and you have been cleansed. Jesus says you must have this happen to you to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Verse six, look at it. He says that which is born of flesh is flesh. You are by rule the same as what you came from. You're the same substance as what you came from. So if you've been born once, you, you, you have the sin nature. You have the sin from Adam. You have a corrupt mind and a corrupt heart and blindness of soul. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't marvel. This should not be shocking. This should not be surprising. The kingdom of God is not the kingdom of earth. And this is the fundamental point that the Jews in Jesus' day missed. They were looking for a political leader to set up a political system and a dynasty whereby they would have rule over this earth. 
and they misunderstand God's plan entirely. Because God does not mean merely to rule the kingdom of man. God means to set up an entirely different kingdom altogether. This is why Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my disciples would carry swords. Mm -mm. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was not made for human beings. The kingdom of God was not made for human beings. The kingdom of God was made for God. To enter his kingdom, you must share in his nature. You must be born again, born, born again. Again, that word gnao, it speaks of a father begetting a new child. And this is what God does in the new birth. God begets you. God becomes your father and he changes your heart, changes your mind. He makes you a brand new creature. And not only that, he washes you clean. He washes you pure. And friend, I don't know all the answers about how it works. In fact, Jesus is gonna say that very thing in verse eight. You're not gonna know how this works. But I know, th I know this, that somehow in the, in the kind and sovereign providence of God, he has called on us. If you are not born again, he has called on you to believe, to repent, to call on his name. And God promises he'll make you brand new. I don't know exactly how that works, but you know what? I don't know exactly how gravity works, but I don't jump off of buildings. I don't know exactly how the new birth works, but I know it works. And I know God, when he bears you again, he gives you a new heart, new mind, washes you clean and pure, and he saves you. You may feel a, a calling on your heart this morning of God saying, just ask me. Just ask me. When we have our time of singing and prayer, just ask him. Lord, make me brand new. Make me a brand new person. I want to be clean. I want to have a new heart. I want to have a new mind. And God, I can't do this myself. It's only something you can do. Please do it. You know what that sounds like? Patrick, that, that sounds like a child asking their father for something, doesn't it? What Jesus says, unless you turn and become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Just ask him. Would you pray with me?